If you're struggling with getting your music out there, growing your fan base, or just getting people to listen, check out my free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. This book is, as the title suggests, it's a guide to getting your music heard. It's not a guide to social media or Spotify playlists, although there is some advice on that. This is the fundamental elements you need to improve and obtain to get your music heard. It's for musicians of all levels, and it's a great reference for building your music career. Get your copy at musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book. Hello and welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. I'm Kane Power. So many musicians out there are focused on getting signed, and while I don't want to discourage you from your dreams, one of the ideas I'm trying to spread is that you need to build a fan base locally and make things happen for yourself, rather than waiting for some kind of golden ticket to success. More and more artists and bands are proving that remaining independent is not only a viable option, but can be preferable to signing a record contract. But there are so many facets to making and releasing music and trying to grow your fan base that operating independently can be overwhelming, and it's rare that the people who are doing well as independent musicians share what's going on behind the scenes. Which is exactly why this podcast exists, and episode by episode we're breaking down the divide between those who know and those who crave the knowledge, thanks to guests like the one I have today. This week I'm talking to Eric Jernigan. Eric is most famously a guitarist and vocalist for Philadelphian post-metal astronauts Rosetta. Rosetta have been a band for 13 years, releasing six full studio albums, two EPs, soundtracks, compilations, and splits. They've played over a thousand shows in more than 32 countries. They have a large, loyal following, and they are 100% independent. I caught up with Eric over Skype while he was preparing to depart on Rosetta's upcoming tour of Asia, Australia and New Zealand, where I'll be seeing them in two weeks. We started by talking about how Eric came to join Rosetta after they'd already been a band for 11 years. My old band, City of Gyps, and I shouldn't say old, it's, it's still an active band, just not as active as it once was, uh, toured quite a lot uh, between 2006 and 2015. Um, and we met Rosetta, um, believe it or not, at a, a DIY uh, basement house show in Detroit, Michigan, I think in 2007. And we hit it off. Um, it was a cool show. It was kind of a party atmosphere. And uh, we saw them play. <laughs> and then as we were setting up our equipment to, to play after them, uh, the cops came and shut down the show. <laughs> so <laughs> they didn't actually see us play that night. But you know, we, we hit it off as friends and uh, traded CDs or whatever it was and uh, stayed in touch through, it must have been MySpace back in those days. And uh, yeah, I think the next time we went through Philadelphia, we contacted them and they may have uh, they may have joined us on the bill the next tour we did. And yeah, the, the relationship blossomed just, just like that. Um, we, uh, we got a chance to support them in Europe in 2009, and then we did some U.S. touring in 2010, and then in 2011, we went back to Europe together. Uh, the following year, we did Australia together. Uh, we just we were just fast friends, and they loved having us on the road, and we loved their music and them as people. Um, we felt a good connection with them, and yeah, ultimately, about the time City of Ships started slowing down for personal reasons, um, they were looking to sort of branch out a little bit. And thought maybe maybe adding a you know a new voice into the writing process sure. uh, could be a way to to achieve that. And so, yeah, I got a phone call one day asking if I'd be interested in coming down to Philadelphia uh, to write with them. I live in New York, uh, but it's only a two hour bus ride. You know, it's yeah, super yeah. cheap and always convenient um, to get down there. So so we gave it a whirl. And uh, I think honestly, if I look back on it now, there was no there was no conversation um, as to whether I would be. A full-time member or whether this was just a one-off you know release and then the band would proceed as it always had as a four-piece unit um but once the record came out we were all extremely proud of it uh, we got a lot of touring um offers and so we just hit it and next thing we knew we were talking about the next record and never really had a conversation as to whether or not i was going to continue with the band i think we all just assumed that since it was a good fit that we would carry on and so we did towards some more and uh wrote utopioid got it out and we've been on the road uh quite a bit since then 
most of the early records uh, was released through translation loss, right? Um, Correct. But yeah, since, th- yeah. since 2013, almost all of your music has been released independently, I think, except for one EP maybe. Um, what was it that made you separate from a label and why have you guys remained independent? You know, I'll be honest, the decision to go independent was definitely made uh, before I was an official member of the band. Um, but I do know that they had a they had a relationship with Translation Loss that was born of sort of friendship and mutual respect. And uh, Translation Loss is a, is a legitimate label. You know, it's it's uh, uh, they work really hard at what they do. Um, you know, the bands on the label sign contracts. They have proper distribution through Sony Red, the whole thing. You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of good things coming from working with a an institution like that. And, uh, you know, my, my band city of ships also worked with translation law. So I can speak to, you know, the quality of, of those guys work ethic and their understanding of sort of how to get their records into the, the right hands or press and things like that. Um, but I think that in, in the case of Rosetta, you know, the band found itself with an audience that was really interested in what they were up to, but they felt like working with a, a label, um, maybe hindered a little bit of the direct connection that they wanted from their fans. And, um, you know, this band has always toured, um, pretty much with a little bit of a grassroots DIY ethos behind it. Yeah. So when you get out there and, and you play shows, um, you know, in say youth centers in Germany or, you know, a, a basement bar in <laughs> Western Canada or, you know, uh, kind of a DIY space in Tokyo or whatever it may be, um, you get that feeling of connection with the listeners that you get to have conversations with people and maybe hear directly how, um, how the music that you created impacts them or helps them or inspires them. And it's interesting to have that experience, uh, again and again, but to come home and, and feel like you have no idea who these faceless people are who are purchasing your music. You know, um, the label is historically, uh, required to account to the bands. And and in terms of numbers, I think translation loss has always done a pretty good job about that, but it's, it's just an interesting feeling to realize, like, I, I don't know whether more people bought our records in, you know, Romania or, you know, Illinois at this point. So, um, some of that, some of that was a, a motivating factor for sure. Have you, have you ever been tempted to kind of create your own label like i've noticed that that your records are coming out as and a title as self-released um you know how many bands kind of create some sort of label as a storefront um are you guys purpose purposefully avoiding that or uh is it just something that you haven't sort of done there there are kind of two branches on that tree <laughs> um we have we have talked about it um the part of the problem is that we just don't have the time uh, we, you know, we devote so much of our energy to the creative process in this band and then whatever else we have left, we pretty much spend on the road. Um, in between that, we all work regular full-time jobs. You know, we're all in committed relationships. Some of us married, some of us engaged, some in decade long partnerships, you know? Um, so there's just not a lot of time, uh, to, to sort of create sort of a functional label. Um, however, you know, the other part that, that, has kept us from diving headlong into that. Even if we did have the time is that we still partner with independent labels for physical releases. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, it doesn't really make, it doesn't make it any, any better or worse for us to put up the album digitally as a self-release. Once we have, you know, a a friend's label who, who may have some renown that's, that's helping to promote it anyway. You know, we don't want, we don't want our relationships with these labels who we're generally friends with ahead of working with them you know, to have this sort of official, uh, uh, you know, you're licensing it from Rosetta records, LLC or something like that. You sure. know what I mean? It's just yeah, easier yeah. to, to kind of let them, uh, let them fly, fly their flag over our record. So yeah, we like that actually. Among musicians, there's like a huge focus on labels among new musicians, you know, people looking to kind of sp- spread their music. Everyone seems really desperate to get signed. Like it's going to immediately change their trajectory of their you know career path. Do you think that this way of thinking, like lumping our aspirations on the approval and support of a of a label, do you think it's detrimental to our progress as artists? I do, yeah. Um, and I can say that because, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago when I was 
first writing music that I intended to release, um, you know, I think it was a little bit of an obsession to, to imagine uh, winning the approval of, of a label who's put out music that you, you know, aspire to, to emulate or, or to find yourself on a similar level with, yeah. you know? Um, but I'll tell you, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of labels from, you know, a, a one man operation up to something more legitimate over the years. And I think the I think the label still holds sway, but the way that it's using the way that the labels are using their power has, has shifted quite dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, to speak to the case of Rosetta, we, we kind of noticed that not working with the label is not really hindering our progress as a band um, in terms of how many people are exposed to what we're doing or even aware of um, our new releases. You know, our, our fan base is, uh, luckily, our fan base is quite attentive to what we're up to. Um, and they, they pay attention through social media or by coming to shows and talking to us or whatever. Um, but we don't feel like we have the same, um, I guess you could call it a team, you know, working behind the scenes for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that, that has felt like a hindrance at times. I mean, we have, we have a group of friends and, you know, our, our, uh, sorry, New York city <laughs> cops going by, <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, we have a group of friends that we love to tour with. Um, we are, you know, always like meeting new bands, of course, on the road and, and things of that nature. But, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of assistance that I think a label, like, uh, I, I'll just throw out like relapse, you know, yeah. um, anyone in, in the heavy music world knows the name relapse. And I think booking agents, you know, uh, will crawl through the rosters of a label like that and see like, Oh, who's putting out a new record soon? You know, like who's, who's kind of, who makes sense to support this larger band that's going on tour. And, and, you know, to be honest, we don't see those kinds of offers coming down the pipe very often. So we tend to do a lot more headlining tours, which is interesting. I mean, we, we enjoy that experience, of course. Um, but it, you know, it kind of at times feels like maybe if we played the game a little more, um, you know, we might see some of those opportunities coming our way if we had, um, yeah, so like a press person from, a specific label, you know, working on the band and pitching us for different opportunities and things like that. So it's a double edged sword, you know, yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, um, we get this, uh, immense satisfaction from, from headlining a, a tour and, and playing, uh, you know, modest room sizes, um, connecting directly with our fans, selling our music directly to our fans. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you know, we do miss out on some of the, maybe the, the hype storm that, that a more prominent label could offer. Do you do you think that the genre and the the scene and the the scenes I guess because you guys kind of cross a few genres and and their communities that you kind of, that you operate in do you think they encourage and support the independent approach more than some other genres might do you think that because of the certain genre that you're in that that they encourage that you're encouraged more um, than other genres perhaps I think we're in a pretty great um, sort of musical circle. Uh, to get support for the type of art that we're creating, because I think most people that listen to this kind of music don't simply look at it as uh, entertainment. There's a there's a definite emotional connection that that people who enjoy um, music of these genres are definitely looking for. Yeah. Um, and and because of that, they they seek to know a little bit more about. But I think the artists that they enjoy, I know I do, you know, and mm. I, I know that the other members of Rosetta are the same. You know, you kind of want to know a little bit of the backstory of, you know, what makes uh, what makes Mogwai tick or, or how did Mastodon like sort of ascend to the prominence that, you know, they have. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and when I listen to, to those sorts of bands, you know, I'm, I'm not, not just putting it on as background music and, and cracking a beer and, and laughing with my friends, you know, I'm, I'm investing myself into the, to the art, you know, flipping yeah. through the, the vinyl, you know, like touching the, <laughs> the record and like really imagining, you know, where, where did the band intend to take me and where is it taking me regardless of what they intended and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I think that because of that, um, that desire for a real connection to the music, um, you know, generally that comes along with a, a hope to connect to the artists too. And in our case, and thanks honestly to Bandcamp mm. predominantly, we've been able to connect um, with those listeners. And, and I think 
you know, to, to Matt, our other guitarist credit, like he, he's done a good job of, of putting out, I guess you would call them explainers, you know, with the records to, to sort of discuss, um, with our listeners, like what we've been up to and why we made certain decisions and sort of what the, um, yeah, the decision-making process was like, um, in terms of the strategy for it, you know, creatively and, um, logistically. So I think all of those things combined have, have definitely given us, uh, um, it's just put us in a spot that I feel like makes people happy to contribute financially to, to what we get up to, which is great. Have you um, experienced that, um, like contribution in the sense of funding your latest record? Um, did you do any crowdfunding or anything like that? No. Um, with the anesthete, the record that came out in 2013, which they wrote without me, but I was a, a contributor on, I did some yeah. vocals on that record. Uh, the band had, through touring, saved up enough money to record and, and release their, their album alone uh, with no label assistance. And that was the, the great experiment. It was sort of the sort of leap of faith off the cliff. And, you know, luckily for them and to the credit of, of Rosetta fans, um, the recording budget came back um, to the band quite quickly. So that was remarkable. You know, as a friend of the band at the time and, and now as a member, you know, it's still unbelievable to see how quickly people respond and throw in their few bucks or, you know, sometimes it's, it's overwhelming contributions from a handful of people. Um, and, and often just many thousands of others who, who throw in what they can afford. Mm. But all those people understand that this is not going to a middleman. They understand that once they contribute that $5 or 10 or a hundred dollars in some cases, which is just unbelievable that that money is going directly back into the next project that the band plans. So, yeah. yeah um, I think I might've lost sight of your question on that one though. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. It kind of made me think about um, back to the sort of community again and how, you know, you've said that when you release your records, you kind of um, also release words around it saying, you know, why you made decisions that you did. And it creates a kind of connection with your audience that maybe uh, makes them more likely to invest in something because they feel, you know, such a part of it. What I, what I want to know is kind of how, how you came about to make Utopioid um, and whether you did it through crowdfunding or whether it was through yeah, previous touring or, or what sort of happened there. Yeah, so that was the, that was the question I failed to answer. <laughs> so basically, when, when the anesthesia process happened you know, five or so years ago now, yeah. um, it, it, proved, it proved the success of the model or, or the possibility for success with the model. Yeah. Um, and, and it, and it happened again in 2015 with quintessential ephemera. And so again, through more touring and, and luckily more support, um, through online sales, um, it was, it happened again with utopioids. So amazing. It's interesting. Yeah. We're, we're very grateful and, and we feel very lucky, you know, um, we're, we're definitely not, not a band that, you know, bends to the expectations of our audience. And we feel incredibly grateful that people, follow us into the next adventure, so to speak, you know, Mm. um, and really try to sort of discover what, what we intended to put out there, um, whether or not it it met their hopes initially or not, you know? Um, so as we, as we worked on Utopioid, you know, um, we had, we had the budget earmarked, um, the entire time we were writing. So there was never any, any anxiety about whether we would be able to afford the recording process or mastering and, um, we, we always had that money set aside um, because generally as soon as an album or release recoups um, the financial investment that we put into it, that money is locked away and it's not touched. So yeah. sustainability is really the key at the end of the day. If we don't have enough money to do another record, there will not be another record. So if we don't save that money or use it wisely, um, you know, as much as we'd love to just take off on tours to exotic destinations year round. Um, <laughs> if, if things don't make sense financially, it's rare that we indulge in those sort of trips, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, do you guys outsource things like PR and marketing and things like that? Or, or are there, are you guys skilled in that area? Um, or do you know personal connections in that area? Yeah, we, we hired a, a person, uh, to do the, the press in Europe. Uh, I'm sorry, in North America. And he worked Europe a little bit, uh, um, for Utopioid. Um, we're, uh, just finishing up an agreement with the European label um, to put out the uh, the vinyl and CDs for Europe. So they have their own press campaign that they'll run for it um, sure. in that region. But yeah, in general, that's a, that's a tricky 
uh, that's a tricky part of the process to navigate now, to be honest, because the internet sort of levels everything, if mm. you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I think, I think 10 years ago, you know, getting a review in print was a big deal. You know, I remember, you know, getting a review in, in decibel magazine, for instance, and that felt like a huge success, you know? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I, I have, ultimate respect for decibel. And, and when they cover anything that I get up to, I'm, I'm thrilled regardless of whether it's in print or online. But I think you see my point that now, you know, there's generally if decibels covering the band, it's going to be online. So, yeah. you know, if we had a PR person in South Africa or whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter where, you know, people can access these, these articles or these reviews or whatever from wherever they may be sitting. So we're sort of still trying to figure that out as the internet continues to change um, the way that people consume music and sort of find out about new releases and things like that. I don't know what we'll do with the next cycle. Um, the guy that we worked with for the past um, past cycle did a good job. There's this other problem um, that we faced where because we're basically finishing the material, sending it to mastering, and basically as soon as it's ready, releasing it through Bandcamp, we're not able to play the traditional sort of PR strategies yeah. um, where, you know, a lot of, a lot of bands on, on labels will, yeah, roll out a song, you know, three months ahead of the release of the album or announce the cover art and the track listing and sort of do this whole thing. And I, don't get me wrong, that's a tried and true strategy, but because of the, the release schedule that we try to stick with, um, that, that doesn't really work for us. So we had these interesting conversations with our PR guy about, well, how can we, you know, how can we sort of capitalize on that? And, you know, if, if like a, a huge, you know, internet music magazine wants some sort of exclusivity, like how can we give them that with only a few days between the albums, um, the album's completion and its release? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's all tricky. I'm not gonna lie. We have we have struggled with that quite a bit. Do you, do you find much help from from your fan base? Because it seems to me like your fan base is um, you know, quite involved and quite enthusiastic. Um, and I mean, that's certainly how I found out about Rosetta. Um, it was through, you know, online forums and um, genre, you know, fan fan websites um, like Arctic Drones and Ave Noctum, sites like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, like, do, you, do you notice that the, the spread of Rosetta th throughout just through your community is, as well? Well, uh, I'll tell you this, as, as an outside outsider looking in, um, you know, five, six, seven years back, I was amazed at how many people on Last FM, if you remember that website, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, were just nuts about Rosetta's output up until that point. Um, and I think that's a great example of what you're talking about. You know, people sharing music with each other, um, recommending um, the band through, yeah, forums and, you know, now obviously retweets and Facebook shares and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we're always grateful for that because, you know, who – who hasn't found one of their favorite records from their best friend suggesting it? You know, I mean, that's the way, that's how fans of music connect is talking yeah. about music, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and maybe, you know, we're not in a, an era of tape trading or CDR burning anymore, but, you know, even, even just sending someone a link to a, you know, a streaming download or, or the band camp or whatever, we definitely see that happening. And, and we really, we really appreciate that. Of course. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, word of mouth. Hey, eh? it's, it seems to be, the strongest way it's still real yeah, yeah it really <laughs> is um what about what about management you guys self-manage as well um do you all assume a part of the role or is there someone in particular who kind of t takes that role how do you how do you do that uh you know everyone does everyone does a little bit at least uh some certainly more than others and you know that, that's kind of an interesting thing to break down because historically there hasn't really been anyone in the driver's seat Mm. Um, and as we've sort of moved into, um, more, maybe the caveat here should be that we're, we're trying to do the band as much, much more of a full time, um, I'm not going to call it career, but you know, whereas, uh, in years past we've been limited in our touring schedules because of our, our commitments to jobs and things. Sure. Um, we're actually, and it makes no sense, <laughs> but we're actually more free now. Um, most of us to to hit the road than we've ever been, which is amazing. And it's a really good feeling, um, you know, to get tour offers and, and not have to immediately sink them because of, you know, a scheduling issue or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, 
in terms of the management, uh, it's it's becoming obvious that it makes more sense to have one or two people sort of stay in charge of these things because you know you can imagine an email chain between yeah. the band and say a, a label who wants to to license the vinyl for the new album that you can't have you know, three different band members chiming in on it, you know, Hey, I think this, I think this. And then the label guy says, but the other guy already said it was the other way. And yeah. 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 So we're trying to streamline that a little more. Um, it's a lot of work, you know, uh, the band is, is lucky to have an audience who's very supportive and we're, we're very, uh, excited about the amount of touring that we are able to do and we want to keep doing that. Um, but it's an interesting balance between, it's not a career in terms of the paychecks, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. So the amount of time that goes into it behind the scenes that has nothing to do with uh, with writing music or being creative or even playing shows is staggering. Yeah. And I'm actually, uh, I'm sort of lording over the, the upcoming Asia, Australia, New Zealand tour. I booked a lot of it or at least coordinated quite a lot of it. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of, I've spent, I... I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say I've spent a hundred hours just on logistics for this thing, wow. you know, since, uh, the late summer, it's unbelievable how many emails have to go back and forth and coordination with the other guys, like booking travel, creating the tour book, all this kind of stuff, you know, and that's fine. Like it, it's work that I enjoy doing because it's for a purpose. And I think that no one else is going to do as good a job as we're capable of doing. So it's almost it's almost a no brainer. We should just take it into our own hands. Yeah. But you have to balance that with your personal life because believe me, there's no, there's no paycheck. There's no extra money coming to me because I put in, you know, a little extra time yeah, compared yeah. to the other guys or something like that to, uh, to, to prep for these sorts of things. So yeah, self-management is, uh, is the only way that we kind of know how to do it. No one is offering to manage this band and we don't really trust, you know, an outsider to come in and sort of make sense of a, a project that's now, you know, entering its 15th year. Sure. Um, <laughs> it just, it's just gotta be this way. And so we make it work. So let's talk about that tour. You guys are coming through Asia and Australia and New Zealand. Um, how, how did it, how did it come about? What made you decide to come down here? Um, initially sleep makes waves offered us, um, the direct support slot on their national tour in Australia. Yeah. And, Rosetta has played with those guys a couple times over the years. I've actually never met them, so I'm really excited, and I, I like their music quite a lot. So I was thrilled to get that offer. Um, but the long and short of it is the the deal for us is that they're they're covering all of our sort of internal Australian transit and accommodations and food and things like that. Um, but we're up against the international flights. So as I started looking around, I realized that you know to fly direct to Perth from Philadelphia is unbelievably expensive. And I started playing with a couple of places on Google flights that we have had offers from over the years. And, you know, uh, I, I saw that we could actually get to Perth cheaper if we took these sort of stopovers, um, in Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. Yeah. And we want to play those places anyway. We've never, we've never had the pleasure to visit any of those places, even, at, even for personal travel, let alone as a band. So, yeah, uh, I, I kind of quickly add up the math and I realized we'd, we'd save a bundle of money, you know, on the travel to Australia just by going through Asia anyway, maybe make a few bucks on the Asian shows to, to help cover the flights. I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's new territory for us. So, um, but yeah, long and short is, uh, at the end of the, the sleep makes wave shows, there's, there's only five of them, um, uh, supporting those guys. So, yeah. You know, if we're going to take the, the time to sit on a plane for 30 or 40 hours each way to get to. <laughs> uh, to the Southern hemisphere from the East coast of the U S we thought, well, we better make something out of it. Yeah. And then the, the New Zealand offer came along, which of course we just couldn't say no to. It's like, we're, we're basically in the neighborhood at that point, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah. And then for the Tasmania shows, our buddy Lachlan, uh, who he's a old friend of ours, who's booked the band on a couple of tours, um, in Australia, uh, he he had this idea that we should go to Tasmania. He's he's played some there with his bands over the years, and uh, he's a Triple J host, so he he has a lot of connections down there. And he booked us a couple shows, and we said, let's do it, man. Like he's he's covering the the travel and you know making sure we're taken care of. So we're just going to go along for the ride and just see what happens. We're really stoked about that. Uh, so awesome. So 
it sounds like you've, you know, you've already had a few connections in place, but at this point are people approaching you saying, Hey, you guys are on the support slot. You know, how would you like to come down here? Or are you sort of putting the word out and saying, we're looking for extra shows around this tour? Yeah, I, I guess it's about half and half. Um, yeah. You know, for the Asia shows, it was definitely, uh, we had the connection in Taiwan um, and, and we just sort of gave the dates and the guy said he was, he was down, make it work. Um, I, a, lo- a lot of our friends have played Taipei over the years, but the two other cities we're playing, uh, Kaohsiung and, and Taichung City are, I mean, I don't know a lot of U.S. bands that have played those places, so we're really excited to just go see them and, and you know, meet some people and, I don't know. I hear the food there is amazing. So yeah. we'll probably be eating until we're fat and happy. <laughs> um, and yeah, with, uh, with Malaysia, um, it was a similar thing. Actually the same guy I mentioned, Lachlan from Australia connected us with, the the guys in Southeast Asia. So, it, you know, it was kind of a, us putting out there that we were interested in doing it. And then luckily, you know, we had promoters who, who knew the band and were excited that we were interested in playing there. So it was kind of a, a nice collaborative effort, you know? Yeah. Do you, um, do you guys bring along, any crew, any tour manager, sound engineer, that kind of thing? No, you know, I guess part of the pressure, you know, on a, on a tour that's, that's on such a tight budget is really cutting corners, um, every step along the way. And, and definitely that means no budget whatsoever, uh, for, for any sort of crew. And that can be kind of tough, you know, working with a different sound guy every day, especially when the, the language may be changing night to night and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of used to it, you know. It's all part of the fun of the show, and you just never know what's going to happen. So it's it's nice to tour with a sound guy. Um, we've only been able to do that a couple times over the years because uh, it's expensive, you know. People that people that do that profession deserve to make money, and we don't want to lowball our friends and say, "Hey, can you come out for twenty bucks a day and two drink tickets or something?" You know? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, at the end of the day, we've all been touring so much over the years. Like we totally understand basically every element of how it works and how to make sure we're where we ought to be on time. And, you know, we don't really need a tour manager in that sense. Like we're happy to work the merch table after the show. Like I said, the whole point of independence is to connect with people that like the band. So no better place to have a chat with them than at the merch table after the gig, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and is, is this kind of, is a tour like this, is it financially viable or is it more about spreading your music and connecting with your fans as you, as you've said? Um, I would say this particular tour is is probably one of the least financially viable that we'll tackle on this album cycle. Yeah. Um, but there is there is some some belief that we'll we'll probably break even on it. You know, we might do a little better than that. There's, I mean, unfortunately, we're leaning on merch sales. You know, for most of this stuff. So yeah. that you can't really predict that in places that you haven't played before, of course. Um, but, you know, Sleep Makes Waves has a great draw in Australia, and Rosetta's been there twice before. Like, there's definitely a, a big audience for the band down there. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, I think the on a tour like this one, the finances tend to tend to be the last conversation that we have once the tour wraps up, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, awesome, man. And finally, is there any kind of, is there any advice you'd like to share with musicians out there who are perhaps trying to follow in your footsteps, um, maybe even in the same genre? I guess I would say... I've been thinking about this a lot uh, because we just did a U.S. tour um, with a bunch of shows in Canada. We played with a lot of great local bands, but from night to night, you know, invariably you, you see bands that you think are virtually a carbon copy of another band that you're either aware of or maybe even a fan of. Mm. And uh, I think I think my advice would be to uh, basically ignore <laughs> your impulse to create a carbon copy of your favorite band. You know, as you're starting out and writing your music, find something that that feels like it's coming from you and only from you. Yeah. You know, I mean, we can't we can't uh, we can't ignore our influences as artists. That's that's for sure. There's nothing really original and nothing new under the sun and that whole thing. But I think it's interesting that so many bands put up this crazy effort to you know buy expensive gear and learn to play an instrument and maybe get a form of transportation to get to the gig and stand on stage. But from my perspective, what's the point of doing all that if, if you're only interested in ripping off the sounds that your favorite band created, Mm. you know, it's a lot of effort to, to basically be a cover band, you know? So yeah, I would say, uh, you know, find something, find something that's uniquely you and be proud of that. Don't be scared of your own originality. Oh, that's great advice, man. So I usually ask my guests to um, put forward an artist um, of the week to kind of feature on the podcast. Um, 
if, if you've got an artist that you've been listening to in the last couple of weeks that maybe you'd like to suggest as our artist of the week? You know what? This is a, it would be my pleasure to share an artist um, who I, Matt from Rosetta turned me on to this guy. Um, he's a California based um, drone artist. And uh, the name is R, the letter R and Benny, B E N Y. R Benny. Um, yeah. Basically makes everything, everything that he does is, is through modular and like hardware synthesizers. And it's just awesome. beautiful. It's, it's amazing music. And it's just, yeah, it's one guy. Um, it's, it's captivating stuff. I, I've been recommending it to everyone. Eric, thank you so much, dude. Yeah, man, I appreciate the conversation. And that's all for this week. Thank you so much to my guest, Eric Jernigan. Check out Rosetta at rosettaband.com and facebook.com forward slash Rosetta Band. And if you're catching them on their upcoming tour, make sure to buy some merch and show your support for independent touring bands. Check out R. Benny at rbenny.bandcamp.com and facebook.com forward slash ntr P-R-G-R-M. That kind of sounds weird, I know, but N-T-R-P-R-G-R-M. Just search R. Benny, you'll get it, I'm sure. This podcast and my site, musiciansmap.org, is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about community, honesty, and positive progress. My experience and the experience and advice of my guests is yours to learn from. Make sure to check out the Musicians Map ebook and audiobook about building success in music. You'll find it at musiciansmap.org forward slash books, Amazon, and Audible. I've also got a free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard, so go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want to get in touch and say hello, please do so via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. I love hearing from you guys and I always respond. Thank you for listening and stay positive. <laughs>